imply that the stuff that you throw away are kind of less important or slave than, than the stuff that you keep. Ah, okay. Yeah. So um, I was wondering if there is a physical mm -hmm. argument. Yeah. Well, so, so two things. So it's uh, you can actually. It actually turns out to be one-to-one -one if you use all the layers. Yeah. But if you don't use all the layers, so if you're not using all the layers, often what people will throw out are the, the lower ones. The lower ones are closer to the diagonal and sometimes consider topological movies, which isn't always the case. But um, but it can be the case that um, really the, um, the features that are of most interest are the ones that are kind of larger and persistent. Larger. Large. Yeah. But, but that, again, that's not always what people want to do. But, okay, um, we also came up with um, what we call generalized landscape functions. So instead of always using isosceles right triangles, we said, well, wh why, why not you know, allow some flexibility in there? And so instead of using these um, fixed triangles, um, we said, you, you know, you can change the kernel. It could even still be a triangle kernel, but maybe we want to adjust the width. <laughs> and, um, and so we allow for that where you can pick a, a different kernel. You can even use a Gaussian kernel, tricubic, Epinekinov, like all these different options for kernel functions, but, um, but allowing flexibility so that the, the width of it can vary. Why might you want to do that? Well, um, if you allow the width to vary, you can get more information in fewer features, um, fewer layers. And so that can help with um, computational speed and, um, and memory, depending on um, how complicated your data are. And so uh, this is this is our persistence diagram. The, the gray is an example of the first layer of a landscape function. And then the black, red, and green are some of the first few layers of the generalized landscape function, allowing for a triangle kernel with uh, varying width. And in this case, the width was set to just be 0.2. So again, so you can see that um, you, you get more ridges with the generalized landscape function than the landscape function. So we, uh, we um, consider these functional summaries for the human fiber data. Um, but, um, but first, we wanted to test this out. So we developed a simulation study. And we call it the pickup sticks simulation. And, um, and so I, some of you may have, growing up, you, know, you get those sticks, and then you drop them, and you try to remove them all without um, hindering or removing any of the others. And so that, that was kind of what the fiber data looked like to us. <laughs> So we developed a simulation study um, that produces images like this in order to have, um, in, in order to um, test these different test statistics to see which ones are best able to, um, to detect differences. And what we were changing in the, um, these six images were the average thickness of the lines. So the thickness is um, drawn, so for one image, the, um, the average thickness of the line, I think in this case is five, yeah, is five, and then we draw from a chi-square distribution with five degrees of freedom to, um, to adjust the width of all the different lines. Okay, so these are just randomly scattered lines, and we wanted to know, could we detect the difference between um, an image that used an average width of five versus <coughs> six? Right, so by, by eye, we maybe couldn't really see much, much difference, right? So then um, going to the persistence diagrams, and then going to the functional summaries. And so to, um, to do that, we tried a variety of different average widths. The, the null um, distribution was with five. So we did five versus five to make sure, uh, to check the power of the test. And then five versus 5.25, and then up to eight. Is the dumb pressure change for, for, for <laughs> <laughs> You missed a lot of the pressure yeah. for your eye. I mean, uh, shouldn't the, the depth rather be more meaningful for the fiber rather than the size? Ah, uh, yeah, okay, so the reason, uh, yeah, that's great. So the reason we actually decided to change the width is because um, the, the fiber data that we we're looking at, what the, um, the researchers did in, in the paper that we got the images from, <coughs> is they actually measured the widths of the strands to see if they could detect differences. And so we thought, okay, so they're inter they, they at least think the width of the strands is somehow scientifically interesting. Um, and so that's, that's why we actually stuck with this. But, um, but yeah, one, one could definitely adjust the simulation and um, try out different, different ways of, of analyzing it. And then, um, so the p-values were computed using um, uh, permutation tests. 
and we did um, 10,000 random permutations. Yep. There's one thing I haven't understood since you introduced it. You talked about um, test statistics that were functions, yes. but you had actually specific arguments of those functions. Yes. As the actual test statistic. Like, for example, when you mentioned the consistency, you said f expected value of f of t versus t. So the question is, what arguments are you using? Yeah, or somehow yeah. using the whole function? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I actually, I did not clarify that at all. And um, and actually, I probably should have left the, the t's out here. So sorry. But, um, oh, so okay. yeah, what we actually are comparing then is, um, I, I think I had implemented, it was either an L1 or an L2 distance between, oh, okay. between the functions. The so function. we're using the whole function, yes. Um, po Point-wise, still. And, but and this consistency that you mentioned about it, that's in some stronger sense, like uniform convergence. Yes, it's, it's actually uniform, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, returning to uh, the, the previous question, uh, so when you measure the thickness, and you're interested in the thickness, uh, this is, uh, okay, you, you can test for that, but imagine that now, in addition to thickness, you have different, for example, the density of fibers, but it's still the thickness that is relevant. How can you tune the persistent? Uh, 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 yeah. How can we yeah. analysis so method detect just that and not be trapped by the changes of density? Yeah, uh, great. So um, we control for density in this case in that there's the same number of sticks in each. Yeah. So how we were controlling for it, at least in, in this study, was just uh, the, the only thing that we changed, other than there were random realizations, uh, was the, the thickness. So but imagine that the density is a nuisance parameter that uh, changes, and yeah. then, then how do you... Yeah, then, then suddenly, I, I, don't, um, I don't know that we would be able... So the persistence diagrams aren't actually... They're, they're not testing anything about the thickness. They're saying, they're, what it's saying is, does the thickness affect the persistent homology? And you can think about different ways that it might. If you have thicker lines, then you have um, smaller potential uh, loops <coughs> because um, more of the dark region, the background is being covered. So, um, so that can affect it. I, I, don't, I don't know if there's actually gonna, if we change the density and the thickness, I don't know that there would be a way with the persistence diagrams to necessarily isolate those differences, other than just saying, yes, they're different or no, they're not different. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd have to think about it more <coughs> if there if there'd be a way to somehow actually pinpoint the specific differences. Um, well, I guess there, there could be one way that would be a bit obscure using a proxy phasing computation. That just occurred to me. But that, that would be, yeah, there could be ways of, of detecting those differences. It would be a very computationally intensive idea, at least what just popped into my mind. But it couldn't be possible. Yes? So this, uh, like, statistically, since you assume I, the uh, computational input method is a distant correlation, not to refer it, just uh, form this uh, long vector and testing whether they come from the same population. That distant correlation really has a huge impact, so maybe that serves as a benchmark that you will beat. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good idea. We. Uh, so we have, have some structure here, so definitely you get you have some information that right. the general method to test a long factor. Yeah. So if um, if all we really wanted was to detect differences, then yeah, there would be other ways of doing it for sure. Um, and that's very quick. They have a R package you can up. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to look into that. Yeah, yeah. It's um, in, in some ways, really what we were what we would want to be informed about is can we detect differences in the sort of topological structure. Like, is that what's differing in some ways? If they're differing, is that what's differing? Um, so, yeah, but that's a good, a good benchmark. <coughs> okay, I got to speed up here. So, um, these are, um, this is for homology dimension one. This is the, um, the null distribution where the, um, the null hypothesis in this case was, was true and all the functional summaries. Um, so what we did was, um, we are still using the triangle, but different bandwidths, and um, and checking to see um, which bandwidth, like how the different bandwidths compare to just the uh, the standard landscape function. And so what we have on the vertical axis are the, the p values. We repeated this a hundred times each, so that's why we have some uncertainty measure, which are these um, interquartile range <coughs> of the summaries, 25th percentile to 75th percentile of the 100 realizations. And, um, and we're just seeing like, which ones basically drop the fastest, because they should all detect differences if they're, if they're doing what they're supposed to, and they should all decrease 
uh, as the two populations become, um, as the two samples are drawn from two more different populations, <coughs> we saw that the generalized landscape functions generally did better than the straight up landscape functions. We think that's because more information was put forth in um, the layers of the landscape, of the generalized landscape functions considered. Oh, I just realized I didn't say. It. So each um, kind of uh, point here on the horizontal axis is the function order. So one <coughs> is that top layer, function order two is the second layer, um, three is a third layer, and so forth, and we considered up to 10 layers. So we were trying to see how, how the information was being distributed among the different function layers. Um, were they detecting similar differences or not? Um, and so from this, though, the generalized landscape functions seem to perform better than the landscape functions. We also considered other tests that I'm not displaying here, um, some that were just um, specific <coughs> comparisons of persistence diagrams rather than the functional summaries. And um, that direct comparison actually didn't do that well. Um, but yeah, so it, it seemed to perform well. Of course, with the generalized landscape function, you have a tuning parameter. So in some ways, it's expected <coughs> that it would do better. Okay, so then we um, consider this with the fibrin data. Oh boy, yeah. I must have the wrong sizing here, but um, that's okay. These were basically all very close to um, the negative four. Um, so this is homology <coughs> dimension one and the, the comparisons between the monkey and human fibrin data. Um, it was still detecting differences. Actually, that first layer was, uh, was very informative. And so the extra layer, for, for all the tests considered, the other layers also detected some differences. Um, for homology dimension one, it, um, they were all very low as well. A few scattered up, but yes, sorry about that, that image. I'm sure it's our fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll just say, it was not like this uh, yesterday when I was finishing it, but yeah. I, um, it, it, the second one's not as, as relevant. Okay, these ones at least turned out. So you, here you can see the, the differences between <coughs> the layers. So this is using the landscape function and the monkey versus <coughs> human for a number of the layers. And this is a generalized landscape function for one of the bandwidths. And you can compare the two. So you can kind of get a sense of how, how they were differing. Okay. And then um, I'm just going to um, briefly say some things about the large scale structure. Um, we did similar tests. In this case, we did a, a DTM over the point cloud to um, because we have point cloud data now rather than images, we have the corresponding persistence diagrams, and because it's in 3D, we now have these uh, these voids that are of interest and that are, are um, appearing. Okay, so we considered a different, a different collection of summary statistics. It actually had more to do with just the timing of these projects, but um, one in particular that ended up doing the best was the Euler characteristic function which is the, uh, the alternating sum of the rank of the homology groups. And, um, and so it actually it did a really fantastic job at, at discriminating, discriminating between the warm dark matter and the cold dark matter data sets. Um, and we also consider, so silhouettes are like averages of um, landscape functions. I'm not gonna go into those details, but um, we consider a simulation study. Um, maybe I'll just briefly mention, mention this. We did a simulation study where we were changing a certain aspect of the large scale structure. We created, um, the simulation was using what's called a Bournemouth foam model, which is an, approxi an approximate realization of a large scale structure. It's definitely not a, uh, a perfect depiction of it, but it allowed us to uh, make some changes so we could just test the effectiveness of the different um, test statistics. And, and so the thing that we were changing was the number of points that fall along the strands or the filaments in the data set. And, um, and this is uh, the, the log 10 p-value. These were the different tests. The main one to um, look at are the blue dots, which is the Euler characteristic function. And we also used um, the correlation function, which is more of a spatial way of um, a, a kind of spatial statistics type function that's common in astronomy. And we saw that the Euler characteristic function, the fact that it's dropping faster than the others suggests that it's actually picking up more information that's distinguishing the, um, the different data sets better. So, uh, there, so we carried out this, this simulation study. Um, then we went to the cosmological <coughs> simulations, which we only did <coughs> one realization of each. 
Again, we had to, to cut up the data set, which is not at all ideal, but in this case, we um, there's this extra issue where the, these two realizations, the cool dark matter and the warm dark matter, had the same initial conditions, so there's a correlation between the two, which you can kind of see in the structure. And so we did um, what's called a matched pair test. And um, so again, won't go into the details just in the interest of time, but um, it was a way of trying to um, to accommodate that, that correlation that's present. And what we found, um, so these are the Euler characteristic functions, these are the silhouettes and the correlation functions. The main takeaway here is that we could, and th this was how many cubes we ended up cutting uh, that one cube into, what we ended up finding is that the, um, the zeroth order and the first order features, we um, rather than just using the Euler characteristics Euler characteristic function itself, we also looked at kind of the individual layers, which would be the, the Betty functions. And um, we were able to detect strong differences with the zeroth order and first order um, homological features, which was kind of interesting. So the, um, the voids were actually not differing much between the two. And it also was more informative than uh, just using kind of the, the spatial correlation function approach. Yeah. That you find p values much smaller with four with, with, with eight times more q. Um, does that indicate that you may have a problem with the correlation? Uh, okay, so the special um, correlation. <coughs> So the correlation between the cubes is definitely a problem. I, I think this is more of you have more data, so if the, there's a signal present that um, you. So if there is a, a, a difference, you'd expect it to be stronger. Um, it's kind of like this whole cool root root end thing. Um, so that this isn't surprising. Um, with only eight cubes, so that's just not a very large data set. So actually, the the fact that we even find differences it is it's pretty pretty good, I guess. Um, I think the correlation between the subcubes, though, is maybe a bigger issue, and so you're su suggesting that um, that might be highlighted, highlighted uh, by what's going on here. I, I think um, one way that I have not investigated it but could is the scale at which we're um, computing the persistent homology over, and if it goes far beyond the, the cube size, in that, the, in that case, then the correlation would be more of a problem. If the differences are where the cubes are potentially kind of intersecting. Um, but yeah, what we'd like to have is a bunch of realizations of different cosmological simulations, which we actually have now in a different setting that we're using <coughs> to investigate a, a, a similar, but um, kind of a different scientific goal problem. So we'll but, but on, on your simulation study, have you tried to estimate the level of your test? Um, is it, I mean, when you target 5%, do you really get 5%? We, we have not tested that. Um, we tested it so with the sticks data. Um, we we checked just simply that the um, in the case where the null distribution is true, that it's unit, the p values are uniformly distributed, and that was the case for all of them. Um, we we did not check the level though. Um, yeah, so that that would be a good thing to look into. Yeah, I'll have to add that to my list. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just skip, um, so one can investigate the actual, um, some details about the differences in the subcubes, but I just want to conclude with one final quick comment about um, this, this new project that um, was led by one, uh, my PhD student, Shin Yu Chu, and this was the case where we were looking for features back in the data. And so going from this persistence diagram, um, this bar that's being shown is, um, is a confidence band. And in this case, it's a 90% confidence band, and it's for the H2 features, so the voids in this case. The points falling outside the band would um, correspond to features that have um, a p-value that's less than 0.1. So basically what she did is she set up an approach that uses something that, um, so a different paper had, um, a different group had come up with a way of getting these confidence bands. Um, she worked out a way to, get, to actually assign p-values to the features. And then um, after assigning the p-values, going back into the original data set, which are these black dots, and, and finding where the voids are, or a representation of the voids. So um, I think we had 23 voids that were present. Um, 
almost all of them ended up being statistically significant and she could find them back in the data and because she actually placed where the voids were, she could check that they found the right void location. And, um, and so this, the different colored regions are the representations of the voids. And then additionally, what it was kind of, it's kind of fun at this point, I think it could potentially also be scientifically useful, is uh, these, these filament loops. And so um, the H1 features are loops. So you can find a representation of the loops in the data set. And up to, up to this point, that's not something that cosmologists have ever looked at, because how else could, how would you find significant filament loops in a data set, except maybe with persistent homology? And so if there's, like a, if there's a characteristic way that uh, filament loops form or are distributed in a data set, depending on the cosmological model that it was generated under, um, that could be useful in distinguishing cosmological models. Which, um, so there, there could be a lot of, um, there could be potential here for um, doing some more interesting science than just locating them in the data set. So um, with that, I'll end. Um, I'll just. This is the conclusion slide. I just cover what uh, what we discussed today. So thank you so much for your attention. Do you see the same 3D picture from the sides in between with the 2D picture? Does it come up that you see the same thing more or less? So if you, if you take pictures, the same cube. Okay. You to take pictures of the cube from the side. Work with the pictures. Huh. Yeah. Do you have a sense if they could look the same or different? Or That's it. So, uh, with the so project, projections of 3D things. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 now you're so Yeah. Um, I, I'd be. I, I'd be surprised I'd if be, they were different. No, I'd actually be surprised if they're that similar. Um, but I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I'm thinking more in terms of these cosmological cubes. One, one problem with them is that there's a, there, are, there, are, there are billions of particles in them, so I'm not sure how clean a, a full projection would be, or if it would just look pretty dense. So if it's just pretty dense, then yeah, they'd be similar. But um, but yeah, I, I don't I don't know. Yeah, that's yeah interesting thought experiment though. You can do it with the hybrid. Yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Any other questions? So I'm not sure if I misunderstood you. You mentioned something about the cold and warm dark matter. Initially, they had the same structure. So uh -huh. what do you mean by that? Yeah. So they were um, they were generated under the same initial conditions. And so um, what I mean by that is, with these simulations, they, they start um, usually soon after the Big Bang, and often the matter distribution is considered to look very much like a Gaussian random field. The, um, the fluctuations, or at least the temperature fluctuations. I, I don't know precisely what they used here, but um, but that initial snapshot that gives the um, the distribution of the matter um, at the very early universe was the same between the two. And then um, the warm versus cold dark matter. What that's saying is they they basically changed how gravity is operating. And so once you have this initial snapshot, it's just the gravity that's affecting them differently. And um, and so. They did that because to control for the differences being detected, just be, being due to the different, let's say, Gaussian rate of field. Um, but um, so they're trying to control for that, and so that's how the initial randomness is actually the same, and the differences are due to um, physics. Okay. So, so to extend your model to consider this spatial correlation, you mean like you assume they uh, come from the same structure and then. Some yeah, yeah. So they have the same, um, let's say, um, pretty washed up. So um, if you see structure here, initially it would have been a bit more random, right? We wouldn't see the the sort of hill <coughs> structure, but then as gravity acts on it across time, structure starts to, to form, and and so how the, that structure is forming it is different between the two. So you could, you could think of it, now, now this is a, my statistician's perspective on this, but um, with warm dark matter, the particles are moving faster. So they're, they, they also have a bit more washed out features, right? It's, like, it's a little um, 
maybe I'm not explaining this well. Um, how, the particle nature of the dark matter and how that's um, driving the gravity, gravitational effect, differs based on, on these different properties of dark matter, how, how fast the particles are moving. And then so the structure is going to form, let's just say, um, at a different rate and maybe to a different in intensity, if that, if that makes sense. Other ways to represent persistent modules, uh, say bar diagrams. Yes. Have you looked at those? Um, so I, I actually have not. Um, I, I displayed. Let's see. I displayed one here. It's. I found that it seems like most of us in statistics have been using the persistence diagrams, while a lot of the, the initial research was using more of the barcodes. I, I'd say that. I mean. I, I don't even directly necessarily use the persistence diagrams, right? I turn them into to functions typically. Um, one could maybe imagine turning the barcodes into using um, some sort of functional representation of those as well. It, it's just um, a little bit, so between these two, it's a little bit easier, at least for me, to conceive of using these points rather than, than bars <coughs> when trying to, to do an analysis. Um, how to capture just a, a bar as a, a data point is a little bit We'll just say it's non-standard. It might actually, it could, um, there could be reasons why it's better, but um, but it's a, it would be trickier, I think, to, to conceive of methods around around bars. But not, not certainly not possible. And for some people, it might be more natural to think of them as bars. And also, what software do we use to knowledge? Um, yeah. So um, for um, for all this work, we are using um, an R package called TDA, and TDA. Um is um, actually pulling in three different types of ways of computing persistent homology. One is using um, software called Dionysus, one is uh, Goody, and one is FAT, P-H-A-T. And we specifically use Dionysus through this R interface. Um, R was, is nice too because they um, have a lot of the statistical methodology built into it. So it's just R, TDA, capital T, capital D, capital A. One of these random books a friend was showing me yesterday an article about the structure of the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian in, in complicated domains. Mm -hmm. You also do get a lot of random filaments if you look at level sets. Oh, okay. So uh, that might be a fun thing to do. Maybe you know something about it. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I've never looked at that. I'm trying to get the picture, but. Oh, okay. On my phone, I have to pay to get the picture. So <laughs> I find the. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, for clarification, say. Um, so when uh, your vibrant data, do you know what stage of the yes. vibrant that, that is? Uh, no, I don't actually. Yeah. I, and I, I don't know if they were all. My my assumption, and this is maybe a naive assumption, is that they were all timed to be at similar states. But I, I that's. Just a guess. Because uh, I was wondering, because like uh, usually fibrin in your blood is really like e even if they activate, they're very unstable. Uh, so to take a picture in that moment, it's not really accurate. But the only time that it's actually stable is when a blood clotting event is happening, and because of the severity of the blood clotting event, it might look different even within a species. Uh, so I was just wondering uh, whether it's more physiologically, uh, biologically uh, applicable if you consider like a different set of like image data to look at. Yeah, I, I think, um, so first, you I'm sure it seems know far more about fiber than I do, that's uh, interesting. But um, yeah, the ideal situation would be if we had many images within the same species or potentially even the same, per it sounds like even the same person, multiple realizations to detect kind of like the within subject variability and um, yeah, at this point we we're just constrained to, oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, very nice nice structure there, uh, spatially complex. But yeah, so yeah, having more data um, is far better, and um, and testing the sorts of things that you just mentioned would be um, would be what we would want to do, ideally. Yeah, thanks. All right, so maybe let's move the discussion to the refresher room. <laughs> Thank you very much for your questions and uh, exception.